Hey there, welcome back to the Aurelius Podcast. I'm Zach Naylor, co-founder and CEO here at Aurelius, and your host for the podcast. Our guest for this episode is none other than Jeffrey Zeldman. He's an entrepreneur, web designer, author, podcaster, and speaker on web design. He's the founder of A List Apart Magazine and the design studios Happy Cog and Studio Zeldman, as well as the co-founder of A Book Apart and the Design Conference and Event Apart. He co-hosts his own podcast, The Big Web Show, about web and online publishing. Jeffrey Zeldman has been doing this thing we call web design for a long time, since 1995, in fact. Through the course of his career, it's pretty safe to say he's just about seen it all. He and I had a chat about how design in the web has changed over the course of 20 years to what it is today. Jeffrey has a passion for design ethics and shares with us the importance of taking the time to think a little more deeply about the things we make as UX designers and product makers. We discuss the impacts of our work and how much responsibility and accountability our profession now has in the world we live. We also talked about the differences in junior designers and senior designers and got into detail about how we can make the most effective and mindful design choices we can. It will come as no surprise to hear that Jeffrey has an intense focus on the people you're designing for and learning everything you can about them and how that leads to the greatest chance of success. We at Aurelius obviously share this opinion and passion, which is why we built Aurelius, the user research and insights tool for design and product teams. Aurelius helps you tag, group, synthesize, and search every user research note and key insight in one place so you can make awesome products and features. You can check it out for a 14-day free trial over at our website, AureliusLab.com. That is www.aureliuslab.com. All right, here's our show with Jeffrey Zeldman. Welcome to Aurelius Podcast, episode 26 with Jeffrey Zeldman, designer and writer. Jeffrey, welcome to the show. Hey, how are you? I'm excellent. How about yourself? I am very good, Zach. Uh, so freshly back from an event apart Boston, I expect. Mm -hmm. uh, anything anything to kick us off and share there? Uh, thanks. Yeah, an event apart is a conference. Eric Meyer and I started 12 years ago. It's a kind of a holistic conference, right? So we get designers, developers, write, people who write, people who design, people who code, uh, a lot of front end, but also a lot of strategy, um, some content strategy, some design strategy, some business strategy, not too much business really, except as it applies to what we do. It's, it's basically a UX and interaction design conference with one... Uh, I'll tell you how it started. We used to go to South by Southwest every year mm -hmm. and loved it. But it was South by Southwest is this great, amazing, huge conference with many tracks. And most of the places where I spoke back in those days, there were many tracks. And so I'd be talking to designers or, or and someone else would be talking to developers and somebody else would be talking to marketing people. And I thought, that's silly. We we all work the same in, in on the same product. We should we should do this together. So the conference is basically one track, one room. Everybody hears the same stuff over three days, and people get to meet each other and exchange views. And we'll uh, it's mostly presentations, twelve or eighteen presentations, uh, with occasional, you know, lunchtime panels and things like that. But but we've got everything from Jen Simmons, Eric Meyer, and Rachel Andrew talking about the new CSS right in CSS grid to somebody like Jeremy Keith basically putting uh, a long perspective on the history of the web and uh, how we go about making a resilient web, a web that lasts. People like Trent Walton, talk, uh, who's a designer, talking about, uh, you know, um, all these things that we add to our sites without thinking about it that uh, that impair the user experience, right? All these third-party scripts and so on. Um, Una Kravitz talking about design systems, uh, Jesenia uh, talking about design systems, uh, different, a, a wide range of stuff. And it's a lot, it's a lot to absorb. And we uh, try to design the conference like a playlist, hmm. right? Where, where there's a, an ebb and flow. There are like 
little thematic connections between speakers and there's sort of a you know a low key start on day two that builds not that any of the information is less important than any of the other but but that you know there's a certain point where you get a meal and then you need to relax a little bit and then you get a snack and you do something hard so it's uh, we design the user experience of attending the conference that's a big part of the conference it's a it's a UX conference that's that's designed intentionally yeah. you know think about that so that's what i've been doing and it's uh very absorbing and a lot of fun and we do this uh six times a year right mm -hmm. so we put on six shows a year yeah well, it was interesting that you referred to that as a playlist um sort of slowly building up to this these crescendo moments it sounds like that's right it was an interesting analogy that you used for that right so yeah so there, yeah um i used to when i would speak at other people's conferences i would sit and watch all the other speakers and i would watch the way good ones like uh there was a guy uh jim hyde who directed um, Web Design World, which was a conference in the 90s and the early 2000s. And there was a, there was a nice uh, ebb and flow to that. And uh, I have a background in music, right? So I also write and, you know, narrative is a big deal. So I hate when things are just disconnected. I, I don't like when I go to a conference and the people don't pay attention to each other and... Hmm. It's, you know, they contradict each other one after another. It's uh, kind of awful. And we've grown this little culture where our speakers basically come in at the beginning and watch everybody else and pay attention to each other. It really started years ago in Seattle. We had a green room at one of our shows and uh, people started changing their slide decks as other people spoke. Yeah to better reflect and now we have our speakers talk to each other before the show we talk to them and we try to we try to really create um a, 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 i don't know if musical event a narrative event something it's so that it's it's educational but there's also a good flow to it yeah i lo well i love that i mean it's one of those things where as you mentioned i think that the, the best speakers already do that and i mean it's certainly something you know, I have not yet spoken at a major event like an event apart, but when I do it, if I'm if I'm later or the keynote, I certainly do my best to pay attention and tie all that together. Yes. Uh, and that's I think that that's a beautiful thing that you're working hard on that with your events in particular. I think uh, very early. I mean, we started really homespun and we always had great speakers, but we hadn't figured out what we were doing the first year or so. Mm -hmm. And we had a speaker. I know two speakers used the same example. They used the same example of Napoleon's march on Russia, which I think they both got from the same other designer. And I was like, oh, that's awkward. Like, that's not cool. So we didn't say you folks have to listen to each other, of course, but but they did. And then there's this, this amazing community of people, right, who are writing for Smashing Magazine in a list apart and who are speaking at uh, the really interesting shows who all know each other and show up at the same events and uh, folks influence each other in terms of what they're writing about, talking about Rachel Andrew and Jen Simmons on CSS Grid, for instance. Those, uh, those two, I don't think we'd have CSS Grid in all our browsers now without them they've just been evangelizing the hell out of it for like five years mm -hmm. they were evangelizing it when it didn't look like it had a chance uh, of ever being implemented and uh, now jen has created this sort of new approach to layout visual layout on the web which uh, she calls intrinsic web design which is like responsive design but the next phase mm -hmm. right so it's the next mind-boggling We've been thinking, but we haven't been thinking about the frame, and we've been we've been still doing these sort of percentage tricks and uh, using these little hacks in CSS. But now we have a, a legitimate layout language, and not only can we do, not only can we use Grid to do the things people use Bootstrap to do without having to use Bootstrap, we can also use it to do stuff nobody's done yet. So there's this sort of pushing for. Um, new ideas in layout or old ideas sometimes jen simmons will spend you know an afternoon looking at uh, japanese design 
from the 18th century and then figure out how could I, how could I use that to affect a web experience? What would be, uh, and of course it's not static, it's dynamic because it's a web experience, but what thinking can I take from that? So it's a really interesting time to be a web designer, I think. I also think our, our medium is growing up a lot in, in many good ways. And, uh, you know, I, I do miss, uh, how long have you been doing this? The design or in general? Uh, well, web. Let's start, let's... Oh, geez. That's a good question. I don't know. A little over 10 years. Okay. What were you doing before that? I was a youngin before that. No, oh, wow. I, didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. I was, uh, probably causing trouble somewhere. Okay. That's, that's fair. Um, but so I started 20 years ago mm -hmm. and one person could do everything. Right. And that's less and less true now. Right. I mean, one person can still create a, a usable website, but, uh, you know, a, a fairly straightforward one, but it, it, that's rare now. And, uh, working on product versus working at an agency, so different, just such different challenges, different joys and different frustrations. No question. No question. Yeah. I, I, I personally enjoy in-house much, much more, but what's interesting is I feel like, I feel like I approach my work in-house like an internal consultant in many ways. Okay. Um, I don't know. I guess the reason I say that is in, in perhaps it's just because of my particular experience and background. I usually tell people that you don't hire me or you don't bring me onto a team to uh, design something for you. You, you can hire somebody who's uh, just as good, if not better and, and likely cheaper uh, to do that. What right. you want to bring me on for is to help people make better decisions. Oh, that's a great, yeah, that's right? a great value. And that's, yeah. well, I, I think so too. And it, and I came, you know, I spoke with a number of people who are in the same uh, sort of like level of tenure and experience as myself. And we were all sort of struggling with this uh, at the same time. And I, whether I was one of the first ones to figure it out or just simply to articulate it in that way, it started to make sense to us all. And I just said, you know, the thing is, is you don't hire folks like us at where we are right now because, you know, I'm not going to make wireframes or prototypes for you. I can do that, but that's that's not the value I provide to you. Right. The value I provide to you is to make sure that we're designing and we're prototyping the right things that are valuable not only to you as a business, but also to the people you're making it for. I uh, recently wrote an article. It's on uh, Medium called uh, Beginning Consultant Brings Skills and Experienced Consultant Brings Value. And mm -hmm. I think that, I think that's it. I, I think, you know, if you're if you're 25, um, then probably mastering all kinds of, of hand skills and, you know, design and code, like really making beautiful things, really getting in there is a terrific place for you to be and going to meetings and doing everything, doing everything you can, learning everything you can. And then if you're 45, you don't really want to be competing with 25 year olds because, they cost less there. They don't get tired as fast as you do. Uh, what you want to be doing is saying, well, taking a long view with this experience, with the sort of bigger picture skills that I have now, I can, uh, I can help figure out the right way to find out how, what we should be doing. And if we're, if we're uh, doing the right thing for the people, for our existing customers and how we might go about finding new customers. It's a, a really, really great, set of challenges and they're different mm -hmm. you know, they're mm -hmm. very different so but you're you're young to be doing if i may say you know if you were just screwing around 10 years ago and just finishing school and whatnot then, then that's fairly young to have made that realization that uh you're now a strategist that's cool and and both jobs are totally cool and i love both but uh there is sort of a time and place for each thing i think in yeah. one's career yeah i think that's right i one of the things, and I, you know, I'd actually be curious to hear your perspective on this. One of the well, the beefs, I, I suppose, that I take with where design is today, particularly UX design, is there's such a focus on tools and process and methodology. Oh boy, and approach um, that I believe that way of thinking that, uh, as as you said, that that value thinking gets very much washed, and I, and I think that the ratio, I think it's imbalanced. Um, <laughs> Disgust yeah. disgustingly embarrassed, if I might say. I think that um, 
Yeah, I think there's always been the problem with web design, interaction design, the technical challenges, the hurdles. So, for example, 15 years ago, we finally had a layout language, but we really didn't. We had CSS, but it was very flawed at the time, and the browser implementations were flawed. And so there was so much emphasis on making it do stuff. There's so much emphasis on mastering the craft that you can forget the bigger picture. So people mm -hmm. used to say, well, I, I'm designing for Netscape. I'm designing for IE 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I said, no, you're designing for people. And then people, you know, 10 years ago, I was like, I'm designing for mobile. I'm designing for the web. And, and again, I was like, it's the same thing. And you're not really designing for either. Yes, you have different constraints in different parts of that experience, but you're designing for human beings. Um, you're trying to make create an experience for human beings, and they're going to interact with you across multiple devices and platforms. And it's not about the platform. And uh, and you know, in the last I don't know six seven years, there's uh, in fact again uh, I wrote about this for a list of part recently. Every few years, a list of parts a magazine I started in 1998 for people who make websites, and every few years I find myself getting angry and writing a state of the web thing. Uh, but, um, you know, there are people now who uh, would be, uh, would be ashamed to admit that they, you know, that, uh, that they just came up with an idea and executed it as simply as possible. They would feel like they weren't providing value. Um, and, uh, I think the experience is the important thing I think there's two problems with where the web is right now. So there's, 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 a, it's wonderful that so many tools exist that allow people to create experiences that are very sophisticated and complex. Mm -hmm. Um, but one problem is people can get so sucked into that, that they're making stuff because they can, mm -hmm. instead of making the stuff that people need. Um, some people instead of learning the basics first, never learn the basics. So they're constantly pursuing these ever receding goalposts of whatever the new tool set is, whatever, uh, and they don't know how to just basically design a simple experience and use a progressively enhanced uh, web standards to make sure it's something that works for everyone. Mm -hmm. There's almost a fear that if you don't master a dozen new frameworks and tools every year, then you're not uh, you're not good at your job, and so they're constantly pursuing that and fearing slipping into irrelevancy. And you've got HR departments hiring that way. You've got companies going, okay, well, you really need to know NPM and Composer, and you need to know these fifteen methodologies because this is what we do here. And anyone can learn that stuff, as you said. The important thing is, can the person think, and yes. do they have empathy? Right? Are they strategic? And uh, so I, I think we're at risk of forgetting our own basic technologies and forgetting the the primary purpose of design, which is uh, to um, solve people's problems, to solve the customer's problem and the business's problem. Yeah, no question. I uh, you know it's funny too because literally just last night I had uh, I had a conversation with a recent grad. They were looking for some advice, trying to break into the UX field, and of course. You know, this, this same story, I don't have a ton of experience, but I, I or, or maybe in some cases any, but I want to get into the field. What should I do? And of course, you know, this person was talking to me about well, what, like, what courses should I, should I take or what tools should I learn or what certifications should I uh, try to gather? And, and I don't know, in a statement, everything you've just said, I would, I would rephrase just because I can doesn't mean I should. It's one of my favorite things to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, uh, it's 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 exactly right what you've said where you can you can chase after this you, you know try to try to catch the wind and be proficient in all the latest tools and whiz bangs and this that and the other thing but if you don't understand why and how to apply those things that doesn't matter at all well i think your first few years in the industry you probably have to pursue those things or you won't get hired mm -hmm. right you won't get the chance to get the experience I'm not saying it's the right thing. I'm saying it's the way most companies hire now. Yeah. So if you come in and say, boy, I, you know, I studied the principles of design with these five masters and uh, I'm really into problem solving and research. <clears throat> Just give me a chance. The chances are you won't get hired. 
So you you know that's that's the mountaintop that you want to climb to. Yeah. But you you do sort of you have to start with skills. You have to be able to say, oh yeah, I can make that work, and I know all these things. Uh, my uh, the other the other problem I think with the frameworks is that if you use them because they're there and because they solve your problem as a designer or developer, and you don't think about what you're doing, you can force the user to download a bunch of invasive scripts. <laughs> you can you know you could you could design something clean and efficient, but in the parts that you made, but just the framework that you picked up calls on other third-party frameworks, calls on other third-party frameworks. There's this uh, tremendous linkage out there and you end up, you know, sp making something that spies on people or making something that's so, so bloated that it never finishes loading for people with slow connections. There's lots of things you can do, although you mean well, because you think I have to use all the latest tools. And the truth is, you should only use them as a last resort. You should use them if you have to. You should use them to prototype and test on users and refine and rethink. But then when you've got what you're what you're making for users and you know it's actually the right thing to make, then you should recode very simply. And I think in code we have this problem. And I think in design we have this problem where uh, you know, there are people who say, like, oh, I it, it's gotta be uh why do I always forget the word for this? Where Different layers are sliding past each other at different aspects, it's rates like of the, speed. The parallax thing? And the yeah, the levels. parallax yeah. thing. So you'll have the client wants parallax or the designer really likes parallax. So I've got this great parallax thing and, and uh, that may actually cause problems for some of your, your people who have like vestibular disorder or and you don't have any way of turning it off. You can actually cause accessibility problems with it. But, mm -hmm. but whether, even leaving that aside, assuming that Assuming that you need to do parallax or assuming that you're going to start, you know, you're going to grab this component and that component, it forgets that you're designing something first and foremost for people. So, um, Jesenia Perez Cruz talks about start with the scenario, start with the, the customer's need. If you don't do that, if you just go, I've got these components and these frameworks, so I'm all set, then that's not really design. It's something, it's a design like activity. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't get to the heart of what good design is about, which yeah. is for people. Right. Well, and and so the thing that I thought of too, as you were even describing that, is you know, so so you heard the saying, um, when you're a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. I, I think that right. being proficient and maybe having these favorites or darlings in frameworks and tools and all this, you it biases how you solve problems. It's just, I, I just think that that's a fact. And you mentioned even the parallax things. It's like, well, if that's what I like and that's what I'm really good at, then all of a sudden everything that we do is parallaxy, or or I take that sort of similar approach when that, that might not be the right thing to do at all, right? And, and focusing on that core of actually, do you have the understanding of the problem you're solving or the need right. you're fulfilling and then working backwards from there? I think if you start with the least, vi like the, um, if you start on, with uh, what is the person trying to do, and then think about it on the interaction level. What is the most important interaction this person's gonna need to do? And how can I get them there as quickly as I can? And how can I make that work on the smallest screen possible? And how can I make that work for the person who has the least gadgety, slowest, least tripped out device? Mm -hmm. So they're on 3G and they're on a train where, where going through the woods where there isn't very much uh, cellular connectivity and they have a tiny screen and they have to do this thing. How can I solve that problem? Start there and then work your way up to the magnificent platinum coated diamond encrusted 72 layered thing that, you know, looks good in your portfolio, but start with the, uh, the most basic interactions, start with what, what the person's come to do and how you can help them find it. Um, Jerry McGovern at an event apart gave a great talk on um, designing navigation and the process by which you can figure out how people actually conceptualize what you're offering. And he talked about uh, the twins. Have you heard this concept? The twins that uh, let's mm -hmm. see, I'm, I'm not going to do it justice. And, and Jerry's an incredible speaker and uh, with a wonderful Irish brogue on top of it. And just, I, I'm not going to do it justice, but uh, the idea that, so for example, 
if my car is broken and I go to the website to figure out how to fix it, one one twin says, "Oh, it's a it's a product problem." So I'll look. I'll find my car model, and I'll dial in that way. I'll drill down to find my car model, and the other person conceptualizes it's a service problem. Uh, so I'll look at repairs, and I'll see. Uh, uh, repairs and customer questions and find it there. And you have to design both pathways. Like almost everything that you do, you put on the web, there's two very different primary approaches to finding that thing based on these uh, two different kinds of people. Uh, he calls them twins because in his presentation, they're like two babies that look the same but wear different sunglasses <laughs> or something. You know, it's you know, cute. But, uh, but that is a thing. That is a thing. And a lot of times, if we don't do that work, then we get something that's designed the way the engineer thought or the way the CEO thought. And the customer's mental model didn't enter into it. And that's one of the big problems that we have in our work today. And, and you know, it's great for people like us, we, like you and me, because we can come in and fix it. But it's actually bad for customers and bad for companies that are trying to make a living. Right? Sure. It would be better if they all figured it out for themselves. Sure, sure. You know, you're talking about some of this stuff and uh, it kind of, it makes me think about this idea of history and design and the web and, you know, even the, any mediums that we design in and you've been around for a long time. One of the things I wanted to ask you is just, you know, when when all of this started, so to speak, right? What, what has changed since then for the better and the worst? And, uh, and you know, where, where should we go from there? Okay, well, I did my first website with two partners in 1995. It was for, a client was Don Buckley at Warner Brothers. He was a VP or an executive VP at Warner Brothers. And the movie was Batman Forever. So it's the third Batman movie. <laughs> not uh, with Va It's the one with Val Kilmer. Right. It's designed by uh, Schumacher, right? So it's not Tim Burton. Still, uh, and I don't know how well it holds up. Every, one, every few years I try to watch it again. I mean, I... I love a lot of stuff, but uh, this is the one that put nipples on Batman. <laughs> um, and I think, I don't know why they replaced Tim Burton. Maybe he was tired and didn't want to be a franchise person. I don't, I don't you know, that politics, uh, I don't know. Um, how we got the job, uh, I was working at an ad agency as a copywriter, and uh, the client asked if we knew how to design websites and the president of the agency lied and said, yes, <laughs> that never and, happens. That yeah, never happens. Right. That's how everybody starts. And, um, one thing that was different, I think was that it was more like paintings and pictures. I think, uh, you know, that we had no models. I mean, the models that were out there in 1995 were, um, uh, you know, there were straightforward documents and we weren't making that. We were making something that was really cool that was going to rock your world. And we were trying to design, I guess, a CD-ROM-like experience mm -hmm. in that only worked in Netscape 1.1. And just, so there was no CSS. There were standards in terms of what HTML was, how HTML was supposed to be used, but very few people were thinking about that. The Well, Sorry, there was one strand of web building that was, you know, doctrinaire and use an H1 for your most important headline and an H2 for your secondary headline. And, but most people weren't, they were just sort of trying to make pictures and put them on screens. And we used image maps. We used the repeating tile, which was newly introduced by Netscape 1.1. And we made basically full screen pages which was unheard of. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what we were doing was wrong. So we did every, we, we made an opening animation and flash wouldn't be invented for another four years. But we, my partner, Steve McCarran took the bat logo and made us, you know, a screen capture of it and then shrank it by 20%, made a capture of that, shrank it by 20%, made a capture of that, you know, made, made a capture, Ex kept exporting it in Photoshop at different sizes. And then, uh, using some third-party software because Photoshop didn't get web colors, uh, converted it all to a bunch of GIFs, and then the animated GIF didn't even exist yet, and then reversed the sequence so that the the bat got bigger as you looked at it. And then we hired a, a guy named uh, Doug, 
who worked at a, a shop called Interactivate, which was an early interactive studio, to write a Perl script that swapped the images out to basically do stagger animation. So how things were then, if you were doing creative web stuff, uh, you had to make it up as you went along. They, we were inventing the rules. The browser company, Netscape, the dominant one, was inventing tags, right? Like the blink tag. Just, uh, <laughs> it was a crazy Wild West time. Um, usability didn't enter into it much. A lot of the stuff that I did, I later, on that site with my partners, um, Steve McCarron and Alec Pollock, we, you know, I would later repudiate, like, oh, you know, like having an entrance screen was kind of animated entrance screen, probably a bad idea, mm -hmm. but you know, but I didn't know that in 1995. Everybody um, did it. Everybody, everybody did it after we did it. Mm -hmm. We did it. We did it. I think we did it first. And then we, uh, we made up navigation based on, you know, we made up cool, mysterious navigation because the only people using the web, there were 3 million people using the web at the time. It wasn't, e-commerce didn't exist, right? There were, None of this stuff existed. We were so I loved the experimentation of that time. And the tools were so primitive that anyone could master them quickly. And I loved that. I mean, I after we put the site up, I read uh, a blog post by a guy named David Siegel, who would go on to later write this book called Creative Kill Creating Killer Websites, but he hadn't done that yet. But he wrote a blog post about how you could use tables to actually have columns and gutters. And I, we went back, uh, I sweet talked the, the Warner Brothers producer and said, can I just get in for five minutes? And via FTP, I edited the files so that we had margins because when we launched the site, it didn't have margins. So it was wall-to-wall -wall text. The text was at, at the edges of the browser window. So I miss the simplicity and the pioneering fun spirit of that time very much. Um, on the other hand, uh, we weren't doing anything terribly useful. We were doing something cool and entertaining, but it wasn't terribly useful. And now we're very much a part of people's lives and we have the power to do good or evil. What's different now is that you can make something like Twitter, um, which gives people, you know, which gives us the Arab Spring, right? It gives us, the, it gives people who, uh, the ability to communicate all over the world, which is wonderful, but it also gives people who hate the ability to spread lies and hate and misinformation and to organize and to incite crazy people to do bad things. Mm -hmm. So I think right now, uh, I think there's so much in, you know, Google and Facebook and Twitter and Apple have so much power and for good or not good and as designers we really have to think design mike montero does a great job talking about design ethics um as do other people uh but i i think uh we're really at a i think everybody uses what we make now when i started in 1995 it was something hipsters did or n nerdy hipsters who had computers right and they would spend all night downloading something over a 14.4 modem and now everybody has it we're always on everybody expects everything to work they expect it to work in their device i would never make a site that only worked in one platform now that's not the idea of the web starting in 1998 my friends and i worked hard with the web standards project to make a web that would work for anyone in any browser or device that's still uh that's still a struggle because there's people who all, you know, make a site with CSS and JavaScript and whatnot, and it works really great for some people and doesn't work at all for others. And I don't believe the web should work that way. I believe, like my friend Jeremy Keith, that the web should be a continuum, but that something should work for everyone, some part of what every experience should be accessible to everyone. So um, very different. It's not a playground. It's not an experimentation place. Some of the joy and fun has gone out of it but we do something that's much more important and meaningful now. And I'm proud of that. And I also worry that we have too much power and that we can rush ahead and make something because we can, which has negative consequences for customers, for people. 
and I worry about that. And I worry about, you know, unscrupulous governments mm -hmm. using information from Facebook to imprison people and whatnot. And we have to really think, what am I making? What am I building? And uh, is it the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? Yeah. So I, we've come a long way. It's been a huge journey in 25 years. That's very true. I, uh, you know, as a, as a follow up to all of that that you shared, I guess I'm wondering, do you feel like it's changed for the better or the worse? And then specifically about the, the ethics and sort of slowing down and thinking about what it is we're making. How do, you, how do we deal with that? I think one of the problems we have is that uh, we have an economic system uh, where a small company, I love small companies like, like you folks, uh, and I have a small design studio and I have a small publishing company. I have a small conference. I love small com companies. I love the idea that different people can get together with an idea and, and uh, do something they believe in. But the, the economy overall rewards big, big companies that uh, can be, can be, can roll over people's rights, mm. right? If, if you have to turn a profit, every quarter and it has to be a bigger profit than the last quarter and the only way the investor is going to get back their ten thousand percent value on their investment is if you radically buy up other companies and change what you do and shoot for the 80 percent and don't think about the 20 percent and don't think about the people who might be hurt um if you're constantly forging ahead and that whole silicon valley idea of work fast and break stuff i think um Zuckerberg said that to his Facebook engineers originally, work fast and break stuff. That has consequences and costs. And that, I think we're not very good with that. And we're at a reckoning period now, right? Where we're, we're, hopefully it's a reckoning. Hopefully it's not just bullshit and talk. But hopefully, um, hopefully Facebook changes somewhat. Hopefully all these companies rethink. And you can see like Apple in the latest thing, uh, just even with trying to help you spend less time on your device that they're selling you right because they know that people are addicted and they know that kids are addicted and 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 uh they're trying to help parents deal with that i think our industry to some extent is trying to come to grips with the consequences of our success hmm. at controlling human behavior and predicting human behavior but i think we have a ways to go i think we have a ways to go in terms of uh inclusiveness both in terms of how we design and who does the designing i think it's very hard you know it's very hard to get a room full of white men in of, of a certain age and only white men of a certain age to design something that's going to work for everybody mm -hmm. just because they don't have the life experiences you know when people talk about diversity it's it's uh it's partly just it's harder to make I mean, I don't know. It, it's like uh, TV in the 60s where there are black characters, but it's being written by white people and it's not quite authentic. It's kind of fake. Mm -hmm. I think there's something to that in the work we do, if that makes any sense. To that, you. that makes a ton of sense. In fact, I've never actually had somebody draw that parallel. Um, and I think that that's a very useful one. You know, there's, there are characters that are, you know, people of color, or underrepresented folks being written <laughs> by not those people I, I think that that's a pretty profound way of looking at it so we need to do better with that and we need to do better with design ethics uh but uh, and we need to remember people before we think about you know platforms and and you know but i think we're doing a much better job with research i think if I look at the professionalism across the board of uh, people who do this work now, um, I think they're very, it's very sophisticated. People are very well educated. Uh, and I think that's great. I think we're doing a lot of wonderful stuff. Uh, I think a lot of what we do is empowering and that makes me proud. So it's, you know, it's that mixed thing. It's, it's, uh, there's no normal for us. It's like, it's hard to just go, well, I made this thing and people sort of use it and like it. That's okay. It's like people, uh, 
I made this thing and some people are getting hurt by it and other people are getting helped by it. And I want to curtail the hurt. Yeah. I think that that's, that's well said and um, well experienced by someone who's been around for quite some time. Uh, and speaking of time, I want to be respectful of that for you. I realize we're coming up to the end of our time together. Um, one of the things that I've started asking people on our, on our show, Jeffrey, is if I had temporary amnesia and forgot everything that we talked about, but there was one thing you wanted to make sure that me and the folks listening to this chat would remember, what do you think that would be? Okay, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's not, uh, it's not original, Zach, and nothing I'm about to say is original at all, but I, I think if there was one takeaway, it would be design for people. You know, find out uh, everything you can about the customer, the user, the person, the reader, uh, and mad make sure that the business goals match to that. You know, in an ideal world, if you do something that satisfies the customer, that's how you stay in business, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I don't know about billion dollar companies, but uh, I don't know how they work. But I think just the general proposition for business is if I make something that makes your life a little better, then you'll probably pay for it. And right, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. That's what most people do. And I, I, so I think always focus on the human. We have so many tools and frameworks right now. It can be very seductive and, and methodologies. You can go to a lecture and read a book and go, oh, this is great. We've, we've got to become a, we've got to reorganize our business according to this philosophy or this strategy. I think every job is different. Every product's different. Every customer is different. Always focus on the human. If I had one thing to say, prioritize the human over everything else, prioritize uh, usability and joy and ethics over everything else. That's great. We are strong proponents of all those things, particularly focus on, on people, uh, particularly at what we do here at Aurelius. So uh, we love that answer, but we're biased. So that's good. That's good. Excellent. Zach, this, is, this has been a pleasure today. Absolutely. Really absolutely. Um, very wonderful. Uh, I think very genuine chat that we got to have with you today, Jeffrey, and we thank you for taking the time. Uh, before we wrap up, is there anything that you'd like to share with people listening that maybe we didn't have a chance to cover in our conversation? Um, no, I, I think uh, we've covered a lot and I'm happy. And uh, if anyone listening is interested uh, in, you know, in what I have to say, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at at Zeldman, right? At Zeldman, Z E L D M A N. Um, there you'll find information on articles we publish at a list apart, uh, conferences we run at an event apart, books we publish at a book apart, books like Responsive Web Design and Going Offline by Jeremy Keith and uh, The New CSS by Rachel Andrew. Lots of books. We've published almost 30 books now. Um, and occasionally I'll talk about my studio, my design studio, Studio Zeldman, and what we're doing there. Um, but I also talk a lot about uh, what other people are doing and things I'm reading and things that are important. And I occasionally even write these little weird diary posts called My Glamorous Life that some people enjoy. <laughs> so follow me at Zeldman uh, if you're interested. And if not, uh, take care, God bless, and all that good stuff. Wonderful. We'll make sure we have a link to that as well as some other things that you mentioned in our show notes. And, uh, and that's a wrap. This is, this is our chat with Jeffrey. Um, again, thank you for your time. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving us a rating on iTunes or wherever it is that you listen to our podcast. And also you can fill out our podcast survey where you can let us know if someone awesome that we should have on the show and even tell us about the things you would want to hear about topics that are interesting for you. You can check that out in the show notes or on our website. Thanks for listening to the Aurelius podcast, the show where we talk with brilliant minds about user research, UX design, and building great products that meet the needs of real people and what you learned about them. Aurelius is a user research and insights tool for design and product teams. 
Aurelius helps you add, tag, organize, search, and share all of your user research notes and customer feedback insights to figure out what you learned faster and easier than ever before so you can make awesome designs, products, and features. Check us out for a free trial at AureliusLab.com. That is A-U-R-E-L-I-U-S-L-A-B.com. Or find us on Twitter at AureliusLab. We'll see you next time. Yeah.